of the atmosphere by volume, and given that it is also a logarithmic effect, uh, I have done the calculations on how much effect that would have on climate, strictly according to the IPCC's methods, precisely to avoid any arguments of that kind, and I think that answers all three of your questions. Sir. Um, in your presentation, you gave a very, very convincing argument as to why we shouldn't trust all of these people who cherry-pick their data, who choose what to believe, such as the liberal left, Al Gore, and even the BBC, and at times you, you, you were in, even went so far as to insult nature. Um, as a politician, as a journalist, as a card-carrying conservative and Christian, why should we believe you? I did start out by saying, it's a very fair question, that, uh, that uh, I was a Huxleyan sceptic, and therefore I was sceptical of both sides of the argument. And I suggest that anyone, particularly who is writing for a university science magazine, I say this in the friendliest possible way, should equally be sceptical of both sides of the argument. You should be as ready to be sceptical of my presentation, however sophisticated, however eloquent you may or may not have thought it to be, as you should of the points which I was asking you to be sceptical of, because the way the scientific method works best was laid down as long ago as 1934 in a seminal paper by Karl Popper, and the principle is very simple. And it is that you can, if somebody who is a scientist offers a hypothesis which needs to be tested, then he must make available his data and methods so that that hypothesis can be tested by others. And you cannot ever prove a hypothesis in the way that you can prove the theorem of Pythagoras. You can merely improve it by repeating the original results and getting the same outcome. Or you can disprove it by showing uh, in some manner that it was wrong. That's the correct way to do science, always to be sceptical, always to test, and as Albert Einstein used to say, always to go on asking questions. Sir, you find the microphone, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, during your very well staged and, and, and very, very in interesting uh, presentation, you, you made the quite obvious claim, I have to admit, that maybe the sun has something to do with climate change. The sun is hotter and we all get a little bit hotter or something like that. What, what my question is, do you reckon or do you, do you think that there is any actual damage, even apart from climate change, that CO2 emissions can make? And if so, do you think that, that this as a problem should be in any way addressed or not? I'm afraid that my conclusion at the moment, it's a very fair question, my conclusion is that the correct policy to deal with our increased CO2 emissions is to do precisely nothing. It simply makes no sense to address what, on the calculations that I've done, is not going to be a serious problem. Now, my calculations are not controversial. They're, based, they're rooted very firmly in the IPCC's own data and, and methods including you know, some quite sophisticated points, such as whether I'm allowing for the mutual reinforcement of different climate feedbacks to, to feed upon each other. All of these things have been allowed for in my calculations, and I can't make it into a problem, however hard I try. And I think one needs to be much more hard-nosed about this to accept that they don't really have enough data to draw the conclusions they're drawing, to accept that there are the constraints upon the effectiveness of CO2 as a, a forcing agent, which are very powerful constraints. They do limit how much damage it can really do. So my conclusion indeed is that we need to do nothing at all. Uh, sir, you, you've been asking for a long time. Um, you said that the, uh, the snows of Kilimanjaro are not disappearing because they're, uh, because they're mm -hmm. getting warmer, because it isn't getting warmer up there. Well, mm -hmm. why are they disappearing? Ah, oh, certainly. Uh, the uh, papers by Molg et al. of 2003 that I cited and a string of other papers that I could have cited uh, attribute it to a combination of the long-term climatic shift which, for instance, has caused glacial recession all over the place and has been a particularly evident shift in that region since long before humankind could have had in, any impact on climate. It dates back in Kilimanjaro's case roughly to the 1880s, if I remember correctly. Uh, and the other thing is imprudent post-colonial deforestation of the region around the summit which has led to desiccation of the 
climate which accelerates the ablation of the glaciers both directly and by reducing uh, renewed precipitation. And those are said to be the reasons why Kilimanjaro snows are uh, ablating and it has nothing to do with uh, climate change. And that does seem to be, I, I won't say it's the unanimous consensus, but it is the overwhelming consensus of the scientific papers which I've read on the subject. Shall we have you in the red because uh, it's a good colour? Um, you say that uh, we're not facing anthropogenic climate change, but you do seem to say we are facing some sort of climate change. So what do you think we should really be doing about this, given what you said about malaria and AIDS not really doing enough? Yes. So what should we get on and do now while we can, or should we leave it for a long while? And what do you actually think we're going to face in the next century, say? We shouldn't be so darn miserable about it. This is not a problem we need to cry about. Even if it is a problem, which really, on looking at it very closely, I don't think it is, we don't need to do anything now about it except adapt as problems arise. For instance, we're not going to get a sudden catastrophic um, collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet or the Greenland ice sheet over a period of 10 years causing sea level to rise instantly by 20 feet in the way that Gore imagines, showing Manhattan being wiped out and the Netherlands and various other places disappearing off the map. This is just not going to happen. So yes, we accept, of course, any, anybody's got to accept on looking at the temperature records, that it's got a certain amount warmer over the past century. But since the last UN report in 2001, and that now is you know, getting on for seven years ago, there has been no increase in global temperatures. Global warming has stopped. Even the Met Office, which is one of the worst of the proselytizers for the extreme view of climate change, has had to admit that global warming at the moment has stopped. So really we have reached a stasis in temperatures. And while this very exceptionally prolonged solar minimum that we're in at the moment, that's now lasted 18 months with practically no sunspots, continues, I wouldn't expect to, us to see record temperatures uh, really very much. I think what's going to happen is that if the solar physicists are right, and they are near unanimous again on this, then in 10 years' time we're going to get quite a lot of solar cooling, which at the very least will offset any anthropogenic warming that we may be causing. But I, th uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that we aren't causing any anthropogenic warming. What I would say is that the amount of warming we're causing is near vanishingly small at the moment, and I don't expect it to get all that much bigger, even with China and India coming on stream. So let's not worry too much. Sir, from, uh, have you asked one yet? Uh, do, do go ahead. Coming to the motive of why the IPCC, Al Gore, and as somebody else mentioned, uh, George Bush's current administration um, is supporting the um, pro-environmental lobby now. I think motive is pretty important. I was wondering um, about the fact that if there is an environmental problem that can be actioned, if that theory survives, let's say, then you will need transnational um, uh, supranational legislation which will mean the reduction of sovereignty for nations. I was wondering if those who might be interested in centralization of world power may have something to do with this and therefore un apparently unconnected groups such as the IPCC, the liberal left um, and George Bush's lot might be being persuaded by this lot. Thank you. That's a most interesting question, and I can give you some illumination uh, on it. There certainly is uh, what I would call, and I hear I will use slightly contentious language if I may, just for once, I've been dying to all night, um, uh, a, 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 an atheistic, humanist, bureaucratic, centralist tendency, which, go for it, um, <laughs> which, um, which, which um, does want further centralization of power in bureaucratic hands. Curiously, there's a rather interesting environmental effect of this. And we need here to, to go back to economics for a moment and cite the work of Milton Friedman, uh, the late Milton Friedman, he died last year, a wonderful man, whom I met many years ago. And his central thesis was that if you allow the state, whether national or transnational, to do any given thing, it will cost the state twice as much and it will do it half as well as if you let the private sector do it. Now, when we say that it costs the state twice as much, remember that cost is a proxy for CO2 emissions. Typically, if a thing costs twice as much, it's likely, broadly speaking, all other things to be equal, to emit twice as much CO2. So if you allow 
centralization of power to increase in the hands of governments, you are likely to increase the world's carbon footprint compared with leaving things in the hands of the private sector. So that to that extent, you, you get once again Moncton's law of opposite consequences in government intervention, where governments try to centralize power, and in doing so, 